Good morning. Good morning. It is so good to be with you in the house of the Lord this morning. Psalm 96 says, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. We worship an awesome God. Would you stand as we lift up his name and his praise this morning together? Great are you, Lord, mighty in strength. And you are faithful, and you will ever be. We will praise you all of our days. It's for your glory we offer everything. Raise your hands. Shout to God, all creation, how awesome is the Lord most high. Where you send us. Where you send us, God, we will go. You're the answer, we want the world to know. We will trust you. When you call our name, know where you lead us, we'll follow all the way. Raise your hands, all you nations, shout to God, all creation. How awesome is the Lord Most High. We will praise you. We will praise you together.
together uh, we participate in the body of Christ we are the body of Christ and uh, we participate in coming to the table it reminds us of Christ's death on the cross it is our participation our physical response of coming to the table and receiving the elements that he gave to his disciples it is somber as we remember the moment when he did this the night of his betrayal but as we eat the bread and drink from the cup we have something that the disciples didn't grasp and know in that moment. They had no idea what was coming, what the following 24 hours and the next three days would hold. But we know, and we can stand in the both and of the moment. The solemnness is not lost on us. But there is a hope and a promise that we cannot deny. The empty cross spurs us forward to the joy that is set before us. Resurrection, yes, but also the undeniable assurance that death does not have the final word. Jesus does not remain fixed forever in death on the cross. The powers and principalities of this world do not, will not, have the last word. Jesus Christ has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God, worshiped by a great cloud of witnesses, all of them praying for us and cheering us on, urging us to keep running the race of faith and living a life that reflects the character and will of the pioneer and perfecter of our faith until we join them in glory. We have a seat. We are going to receive communion together. You do not need to have been a member as a part of our church. Um, you do not need to have taken any special classes in order to receive the Lord's Supper. You simply, communion is open to all who believe in Jesus as their Lord and Savior and who are seeking his grace in their life. 
There will be servers who will come and they will pass out prepackaged cups to you as you remain in your seats. Please simply hold on to them and wait and we will together be led through the receiving of the bread and the juice. Um, communion is a sacrament. It was instituted by Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And this sacrament simply proclaims his life, his sufferings, his sacrificial death and resurrection, and the hope of his coming again. Communion is also a means of God's grace. And this means of grace is, um, Christ is present. Christ is fully present by the Spirit through this. And because of that, we want to receive this communion with reverent appreciation and gratefulness for the work of Christ. All who are truly repentant, who are forsaking their sins, who are believing in Christ for their salvation, and are seeking his grace, are able to receive the Lord's Supper. You are welcome to stay in your seats for this, or you are welcome to come up to the altar, whichever is the most comfortable for you. Um, servers, would you please come forward? I was a wretch, I remember who I was, I was lost, I was blind, I was running out of time, sin separated, the breach was far too wide. From the far side of the chasm, you had me in your sight. So you made a way across the great divide, left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside. And there at the cross, Paid the debt I owe, broke my chains, freed my soul. For the first time, I had hope. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood of life. Thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white. Jesus, you have saved my life, brought me from the darkness into glorious light. You took my place. You took my place, laid inside my tomb of sin. You were buried for three days, but then you walked right out again. And now death has no sting, and life has no end. For I have been transformed by the blood of the Lamb. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood of life. Thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life, brought me from the darkness into glorious light. Nothing stronger than the wonder-working power of the blood, the blood that calls us sons and daughters. We are ransomed by our Father through the blood, the blood. 
something stronger than the wonder-working power of the blood, the blood that calls us sons and daughters. We are ransomed by our Father through the blood, the blood. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood, the blood. Thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white. You have saved my life, brought me from the darkness into glorious light. Brought me from the darkness, brought me from the darkness into glorious light. Let us pray. Lord, we have come in faith, believing that we are at your table, Lord. We pray, would you bless the bread and the cup with your life, so that as we partake of these, the life of Christ will nourish us. And Lord, as we feast at your table, grant us grace and forgiveness and cleansing and healing through the power of your life, death, and resurrection. Amen. And now if you open up the bread side of your packaged cup. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, broken for you, preserve you blameless unto everlasting life. Eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you, and be thankful. And now, the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, shed for you, preserve you blameless unto everlasting life. Drink this in remembrance that Christ died for you, and be thankful. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, pioneer and perfecter of our faith, we thank you for refusing to give up on us and on the world. You gave up your very life for our sake, pouring yourself out completely so that even the cross could be transformed into a means of life and grace. Lord, we seek now to run our race of faith encouraged by the promise of seeing God face to face and joining in worship with a great cloud of witnesses. We thank you for your faithfulness to us, that we can place our hope, trust, and faith in you, fully believing and knowing that you have the final word. We pray all of this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's continue worshiping this morning. Feel free to stand or remain seated, but let us thank God for his faithfulness and praise him for how he keeps his promises to us. God of Abraham, you're the God of covenant, of faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proven, you do just what you say. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come to pass. Great is your
your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness to me. From the rising sun to the setting, same I will praise your name. Great is your faithfulness to me. God from age to age. God from age to age, though the earth may pass away, your word remains the same. Your history can prove there's nothing you can't do. You're faithful and true. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come to pass. Great is your faith. To the setting, same I will praise your name. Great is your faithfulness to me. I put my I put my faith in Jesus, my anchor to the ground, my hope and firm foundation. My anchor to the ground, my hope and firm foundation, he'll never let me down. I put my faith, I put my faith in Jesus, my anchor to the ground, my hope and firm foundation. From the rising sun to the setting, same I will praise your name. From the rising, from the rising sun to the setting, same I will praise your name. Great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness to me. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the faithful, good, and righteous God. That you are the Lord who always keeps your promises. You are the God who is gracious and merciful in salvation even as you are just in your judgments. Lord God, we thank you for your faithfulness from generation to generation, that you have always kept your promises. Your plans for our salvation have been unwavering. Lord God, we are so grateful to be in your presence, to worship you, to praise you, to declare your glory 
and might, your goodness and your faithfulness. Because you are faithful and you are good. And sometimes, a lot of the time, when we are walking in the midst of the hard and the dark and the difficult and the painful, it's really hard to remember your goodness to us. And it can be really hard to declare that you are faithful. But God, we know, we know that you are because we have seen it. We are seeing it. We are watching it in the lives of those around us. That's what it's like to be the body, God. That we can stand arm in arm, hold each other up, celebrate with one another, grieve with one another, that we get to share and we are thankful to get to do that with each other, to be your body, your hands and feet, God. We thank you that we are able to worship you, to be in your presence, to lift up your name. There's nothing like it. Lord God, continue to move in this place continue to speak to us, in us, and through us. We give you all the praise and all the glory, and we pray all of this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God indeed has been faithful to us. And one of the things we do in worship is, or one of the ways that we worship is by trusting God, trusting him um, when it's really hard. And um, one of the things we can trust him with, one of our acts of worship and trust can be releasing our hold on those things that he has given us, our gifts, our talents, our resources, and giving those back to him for his purposes. And that's a hard thing to do, but that's what we do in worship. Um, And so just a reminder, our offering boxes are located at the doors as you enter the sanctuary and as you enter the front door of the church. In the seat back in front of you is a communication card. It's a great way for you to stay in touch with us, give us updates and your contact information. Um, I promise we don't want to misuse it. We just want you to make sh- we just want to make sure that you feel that you are a part of the church family. And if you are not receiving information from us, we want to correct that. Um, We uh, have, as you'll see in your bulletin, um, we have a little card in there. We're um, kicking off a new project. We're going to start to see some dust flying. We already have a little bit of that going on. Um, And that is because we are uh, going to be opening up the section over here to make space so that we can welcome everyone into the church, so that it's not so tight and we're not bumping shoulders when we're walking around. Um, I am thankful as I look back over the history of this church in particular of the way that the church has responded so faithfully to God's call to open our doors to all of those in our community. And we have this legacy of people who were flexible and moved along each time that there was a need. And as we started out in this little church as a barn and then down on First Street and now at this facility and each time adding on and allowing more and more growth so that we could welcome people into the church. Change is hard, but I'm thankful for the way that the legacy of our our forefathers and um, the family here have um, opened their doors so that we could respond to the needs. And so as we are beginning to do this small project of opening things up so we can allow more people to come in and feel welcomed and have that opportunity to share with one another um, on a Sunday morning, um, we are um, also going to be raising funds to complete the project. We have a goal of $50,000 to um, add to what we have already saved for the project. And so we ask that you would allow the Lord to speak to you in these moments, in these next few days, 
and consider making a pledge to help support that and be a part of that legacy that opens the doors. Um, I think in the bulletin it says we're collecting those pledges on the 17th. You are welcome to give that pledge at any time. You do not need to wait for the 17th, so feel free to drop that in the offering box, hand it to Pastor Tim on your way out. Um, but please, allow the Lord to speak to you and see how he would direct you in that. The final thing I want to remind you of is that Easter is on March 31st. And one of the big things we do here, one of the great tools available to um, our children's ministries, to Pastor Sarah, to all of our children's ministries workers, is an Easter egg hunt, which allows them to do an object lesson relative to um, the Easter story. And we really need candy for that. And we are thankful for those of you that have donated, but there is still lots of candy to be had. So if you would be willing to bring in a bag of candy, we could drop it off on Sunday morning. Um, we're going to be collecting those for a few more weeks, and then we will stuff those eggs. Um, we're going to stand for a moment and greet our neighbor. series on the Sermon on the Mount. Sermon series on the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 6 today, Matthew chapter 6, beginning with verse 1, and we're going to look through parts of that. So we've been talking about the Sermon on the Mount, who is blessed, who is really well off. That's the way Jesus starts it. The blessed life we talked about the last few weeks is the uh, is really a fruitful life. We talked about the creation story last week and how that God created everything and blessed them, the plants, the animals, the life. He blessed, and so everything grew and um, began to reproduce and fill the earth because God had an intention for the planet Earth, and that was that uh, creatures would fill this planet and uh, the glory of all that He created would be revealed. And of course, we, humankinds, were called to be uh, created, with, crowned with glory, as Scripture says, made a little lower than God, and given the task of ruling over all creation. And so we have a purpose, uh, to love God, to love our neighbor as ourselves. Um, a blessed life is to grow and become all that God wants us to be. And that is... Uh, at the end of the sermon of chapter 5, the work talks about be perfect as your father is perfect. That word teleos is goal. It is holistic life. It is, uh, it is becoming everything God called us to be. And as we've been looking at this, Jesus makes it clear that what is the blessed life according to him, it does not look like the blessed life according to most people. That he didn't say, blessed are the wealthy. He didn't say, blessed are the talented. Blessed are the powerful. Blessed are the beautiful people. Uh, blessed are those who have no problems in life. That's what we normally think. Um, but he didn't say that. He, he talked about something different. C.S. Lewis always said, if you want a religion to make you feel comfortable, I would not recommend Christianity. <laughs> uh, Christ didn't come just to make us feel comfortable and give us an easy life. Um, and so in one sense, when Jesus talks about the blessed life, it doesn't look attractive to us. Suffering and persecution is a part of that. The picture that Jesus paints in chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount that we read about is not the picture of Adam and Eve in paradise, walking with God in the garden, and everything seems to be going well, harmony and peace. For we have lost the Garden of Eden. We have lost paradise. Sin has entered our world, and we live in a world of violence, a red tooth and claw, as the saying goes, blood of bloodshed, and Jesus came to confront that. That's, that's what the Lord's Supper partially is about. It's about understanding what Jesus came to do. He came to confront sin and death. He came to confront the grave. Through the cross and resurrection, he brings new creation. New creation is heaven and earth coming together. It's the kingdom of heaven and earth coming together, and it starts in our heart. Anyone who believes in Christ is new creation, Paul says. And, and, and so uh, 
The picture Jesus paints on the Sermon on the Mount is not a picture of the Garden of Eden paradise. That is not the blessed life to stroll through a paradise. The Sermon on the Mount is, is a picture of people who are blessed and, and because they are continuing the ministry of Jesus to bring healing and redemption to this world. They are blessed people by God and they are called to be a blessing, which is the call of Israel years ago. To be kingdom of heaven people means we are on a mission, the mission of Jesus Christ, shaped by the cross, the cross kind of shaped life. And we believe it is the hope of the world. The more I study the Bible, the more I study the cross of Jesus Christ, the more I am convinced that this is the message the world needs to hear. It is the message we need to hear. Uh, and so we are to be kingdom of heaven people in this world. Kingdom of heaven people in a world that is opposed to God. As C.S. Lewis says, we are an enemy-occupied territory. That is what the world is. And Christianity is the story of how the rightful king has landed. Uh, you might say landed in disguise and is calling us to put, take part in the great campaign of sabotage. That's, that's why the Sermon on the Mount looks the way it does. It's because Jesus is describing how we can be kingdom people in a world that is so opposed so often to kingdom things. This morning I was reading in the Wall Street Journal about a Russian pilot who defected from Russia, moved to Spain. Just a few weeks ago he was shot to death and ran over by a car. He was executed. Sometimes those things happen when we oppose the powers of the world. There is a temptation to sell out. There's a temptation to turn a blind eye to the brokenness of the world. There is a temptation to give in to an easy, comfortable life, to go along because, you know, if you try to stand up against things, you might get persecution, which Jesus talks about in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness' sake. That's not an easy life, but that is the life we're called to do, right? Right? I mean, that is what Jesus is trying to do. He's trying to create people who are going to be salt of the earth, light of the world. And that's why I keep coming back to the rich young ruler. And interesting, it just kind of happened that way. Every time I think on the Sermon on the Mount, I come back to that because he had a very comfortable, successful life. Everything you would hope for, it looked like the blessed life. But Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, if you want to be teleos, if you want to have a life where you're hitting the bullseye in the center of who God called you to be, if you want to be all that God created you to be and live the beautiful life, then you need to give away all that wealth and come and follow me so that you can experience everything you were intended to be. But he walked away sad because he had great wealth. Couldn't give up his kingdom for the kingdom of heaven. And so what is it we are clinging on to that will not let us follow Jesus? Can we come to Jesus empty in spirit? Poor in spirit. Fill me, Jesus. Remake me. Jesus said he is going to fill us with the Holy Spirit, which is the new wine. He talked about it. The new wine cannot be contained in old wineskins. The old wineskins are too rigid, cannot be stretched, and therefore they crack and break. And so also, we need to be new wineskins that can stretch. When the Holy Spirit begins to work in our life, He wants to stretch us. He wants to make us a little uncomfortable. The Holy Spirit wants to push the borders of your life to stretch the limits till maybe you feel like you're breaking. But he is doing this so that we can be a part of the great adventure. And Matthew 5 sets up a vision for such a life. After describing the life in chapter 5, he gets into chapter 6. And he begins to talk about how we can live such life in some interesting ways. And um, he talks about these three practices of the Christian life. And he talks about hypocrites. So we're going to look at Matthew chapter 6, we're going to begin with verse 1, but then we're going to skip the sermon or skip the Lord's Prayer because we're going to talk about that next week. Uh, and then we're going to jump to the, at the end of that uh, to verse uh, 16 and finish up that thought. In the middle of this thought, Jesus puts the Lord's Prayer in there. 
Uh, and so we're going to kind of move around that so we can get to that next week. Matthew chapter 6, beginning with verse 1. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. And then jumping down to verse 16. And when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Do not store for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So Jesus warns us about hypocrisy, but it is interesting what he defines as hypocrisy because it's, it's not what we think. In fact, it, when it, I've read this many times, but I don't know that I quite fully grasp all that Jesus was saying in this passage that seems pretty straightforward because he isn't talking about hypocrisy like we think. We think hypocrisy is, I say one thing, but I do the other thing, right? We present ourselves uh, to be one way that we are not. But that is not what Jesus is talking about in this section. He will talk about that at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. That is his great conclusion. In fact, I can't wait to get to it. It's such a good conclusion. I'm looking forward to getting to that. But that's, that's, that's for that. That is not his focus here. In fact, the, in fact, the hypocrites are doing exactly what they profess to do in one sense. But they are doing it... Um, to get praise from others. They're doing it to get praise from others. See, there's nothing wrong with them doing it to get a reward, in fact. Jesus says that. Jesus talks a lot about getting a reward from God. The problem is, whose reward, whose praise are they seeking? Is it the praise of people or is it the praise of God? That's why they are hypocrites, because they are doing acts of devotion directed to God, but they are not doing them in order to be praised by God. They are doing them to be praised by people. So what they are doing is to act as if they are doing something for God when it is not about God. So there are people that when they give to the poor, they announce it with trumpets. They toot their own horn, which is, I guess, where this phrase came from. Uh, do they do it literally or is it figuratively? I'm not sure. It's hard to imagine people actually bringing a band along with them every time they gave to the needy, but maybe they did that. But these are people who want to make sure that everyone knows when they give something, when they do something. They like to be known, to be seen. And when they pray, they pray on the street corners and in the synagogues to be heard by others. They try to impress people with their many words. 99% of you do not struggle with that because you do not like praying in public at all. You have no desire to do that. These people like to pray in public to be heard, to be impressed. When they fasted, they walked around somber. Now we can relate to this a little better. When we 
go through a struggle. Sometimes we like people to know we're going through a struggle. And we, we'd make that a little more obvious than maybe we need to. Um, but, but when they're fasting, they walk around somber and they're uncomfortable faces. They disfigure their faces. And if someone comes up to them saying, you okay? And they, they would go, you know, oh, I'm okay. I'm making it, just making it. Jesus describes these people and he says they're not directing their acts toward God. They're directing them toward others. So he says, when you do these things, you should do them in secret. Now, I don't think he's making a rule that we have to pray in secret all the time, or we'd have just broken that this morning. That's why I didn't want to pray at the beginning of the service, because I didn't want to, you know, um, let, the, let the other people do it. No, um, I don't think he's making it a rule that we can't give or pray or fast without anyone knowing it. Um, in fact, Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, let your light shine before people that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. So it's not as if we have to even hide that in a sense. He is, he is really trying to say, what is the key focus of your life? Is it to receive praise from God or praise to other, from others? The hypocrites were engaged in ancient practices designed to transform their heart before God as an act of love for God, generosity, praying, and fasting. They are good practices, but they are practicing them incorrectly. There's an old adage that says, practice makes perfect. That's wrong. It is practice, it is perfect practice that makes perfect, right? I can practice golf every day, but if I'm not practicing it correctly, then I'm not going to get any better, right? If I'm going to practice golf, then I should practice it correctly. If I'm going to spend all that time uh, practicing golf, I should learn how to do it correctly, and that's a good principle, right? Because it is pra perfect practice that makes perfect. And so why not do it correctly? If I'm going to spend eight hours a day at work, why not try to figure out how to do my job well? I'm going to do it anyway. I might as well learn how to do it well, right, and do it correctly. If I'm going to spend the time and energy trying to get my children to do what they should, why not learn how to teach them correctly? And I'm making a plug for the love and logic class going on. In fact, I, as a part of my Lenten sacrifice, not really, I, am, uh, I offered my children, I will watch your, grand, your children so you can go to the Love and Logic class. And, uh, and they took me up on that. And I say it's a sacrifice, but it's not a sacrifice because actually it's kind of a selfish act. I, I want them to go to Love and Logic because I'm going to spend a lot of time with my grandchildren. And I want to enjoy the time I spend with them, right? <laughs> and I want other people to enjoy spending time with my grandchildren. And so, uh, so you know, if you're going to discipline your children anyway, you might as well do it correctly, right? If you're going to practice anyway, you might as well practice correctly. If I'm going to think about conflict, which I'm, I'm going to, I probably should think about it correctly. If I'm going to think about how I spend time with difficult people and how difficult people, I ought to begin to think about what is the right way to think about these situations, and correctly, practicing something correctly means that I am getting what I want out of it. If I, if I practice golf correctly, that means I'm going to be able to shoot a good score. If I'm practicing work correctly, I'm going to be successful at work. If I'm practicing discipline with my children correctly, I'm going to have well-behaved children. And so am I practicing in a way that gets what I want. That's, that's how you can tell if a practice is effective or not. Do I have good habits and practices that get what I want? Right? Many times people are just, we just have these habits that just kind of grow on us. We, we have no reflection on it. We, we just develop these habits and practices and we just do whatever we do and we don't think about it and habits are formed. I mean, certainly with, with parenting, that's the way it is. We, we learn from our parents, good or bad, and then we try to teach our children and we really don't think about it sometimes. We just kind of react sometimes and, 
And, and, and, and many times in life, we, we develop practices and habits, daily practices and habits that are just formed, and we don't think about them. And we are like a wind blowed by the wind. Whatever wind kind of comes, that's kind of what we develop. And we just go with it. And so we develop all kinds of bad habits. We can develop the habit of anger, you know, a habit of complaining. We can develop bad habits at work. We can develop bad habits in our marriage. We, we, can, we can develop these bad habits. And those habits produce something. Galatians says that a man reaps what he sows. And, and so there is this tendency sometimes to engage in practices in which we never really think about, is it really going to bring about what I hope for? Or is it, am, I, am, I, am I just doing it mindlessly? What are my practices getting me? Now, hypocrites are hypocrites because while they are doing practices that are directed to God, they are focused on praise of others, for they are seeking praise of others. And so everything they do is geared to that. They do everything with an eye to others rather than God. So in one sense, their practices are getting exactly what they want. Jesus says that. They are getting exactly what they hope for. They're getting praised by people. But that's all they're getting, human praise. That's it. When, when they are doing an action directed toward other people instead of God, other people are rewarding them, and that's it. Now, human praise is wonderful. It's not wrong to receive human praise. We should. If we're doing some good things, people should say good things about us. There's nothing wrong with that. But just remember, human praise doesn't last very long. And by the way, that's why Jesus talks about treasures. He talks about treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy. It's not going to last very long. But any treasure we get in heaven is kept in heaven. It is safe for us. It, it doesn't end. It's eternal. It goes on. The rewards of, of, of treasuring kingdom things is going to last not only in this age, but in the age to come. The problem with human praise, it just doesn't last that long. The good feelings we have of being praised go away quickly, and we need more. If we live for human praise, we will have a never-ending need for more of it. That's just the way it is. I'm successful in one thing. People praise me before long. That doesn't do much for me anymore because that's old news, and now I need to try to have praise in some other ways. Jesus said the hypocrites are getting exactly what they want. What do we really want? We think we, we, we want that promotion, um, and then we get it and realize that we were just wanting to build our ego out of it. That's all we were doing. It was about human praise. It wasn't about having opportunity to do something to develop us. How much of our life is about building up, propping up a fragile ego. ego. Why do we do what we do? How much of it is connected to getting praise from people? And so, why do we do what we do? What do we really want? And then there's a more important question than that. Because you have to ask yourself, what am I really after? Hypocrites were after praise for people. That's it. Our, what are we really after? But the next question is this. It's even a more important question. Is what I want out of life worth wanting? Worthy of the life that I have been given? Is what I want worth wanting? Is it worth pursuing? If I give my whole life to this want, is it worthy of a life lived? What is worthy of living a, of a life lived? What is a want 
that is worthy of us. Now, now some people will say, well, that's just a choice. Everyone can choose whatever they want to live for. They have a right to pursue their own happiness, and it doesn't matter what you choose. It doesn't matter what choice you make. Um, but are my desires worth desiring? Or does it really make a difference? And if it doesn't make a difference, then how does life make a difference? If it doesn't make a difference on what I choose, I can choose to do whatever I want, then what does that say about life? Miroslav Volf tells a story of Albert Speer Albert Speer was an intelligent young man, a brilliant architect. I mean, he spent his life, his early life, just wanting to be an architect and studied that and became a brilliant architect. Hitler offered him the role of being chief architect for the Nazi party. He was less than 30 years old, and he found that impossible to pass up. After all, he said, above all else, I'm an architect. And so Hitler gave him the opportunity to design buildings like of which he said would never be seen for, for in 2,000 years, hadn't been seen for 2,000 years. And he just couldn't resist. And so he said yes. And he participated in some of the worst crimes in human history, serving the German war effort, making use of slave labor and meanwhile, he did indeed design spectacular buildings. There was a certain greatness about Albert Speer, a certain desire and dream that he had, a want that he had. But his demise lie in the fact that he said, above all else, I am an architect. It was that singular devotion to a desire that made him an exceptionally good architect, but also enabled him to participate in the, uh, the, the terrible deeds that were done in Nazi Germany. See, it is possible to succeed in our highest aspirations and yet fail in our basic calling as human beings. So it's not just what you want, figuring out what you want, and figuring out practice to get what you want. What is our singular devotion in our life? What is the greatest want in your life? Getting back to the sermon, Jesus calls them hypocrites because while they are doing right things, they are doing it for the wrong reason, to be seen and approved by people, to receive the praise of people rather than the praise of God. It is that singular devotion that Jesus is calling us to. Live your life for one singular devotion, the praise of God. Seeking God's praise and honor. We are to live our lives to seek the praise of God. We are to live our lives responsible to God, and that's really key to recognize that we have a responsibility to God first and foremost. That our lives are not just simply our own to do whatever we want, to desire whatever we want, that we have a responsibility to God and therefore our first goal is to seek the praise and approval of God in our lives, to recognize His calling upon our life. Without this sense of responsibility, and some people believe that I'm only responsible to myself. That's it. I only have to answer to myself. But without this sense of responsibility to God, our life lacks urgency. The problem is that if we answer only to ourselves for living, then whatever choice we make is going to be okay which makes life seem very arbitrary. And it makes choices very hard to make. Because then it's just a matter of preference. Choices in our life, whether to career to pursue, whether to start a family, what to do in our retirement, all these things 
can seem so many choices, too many options that are valid if it's up to us. Because ultimately, if it's just up to us, then if it's just preference, then our choices really ultimately do not matter. But if we are responsible, then what we do truly does matter. Then life really does matter. That is what Jesus is getting at in the sermon. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Where your treasures are, your heart will be also. Your heart will get involved in the things that you think about, the things that you focus on, the things that you spend your time on, the things that you dream about. Wherever you put that, that is where your heart will follow immediately after it. What is our singular devotion? What are we treasuring? We are called, Jesus is calling us to do everything for him. He is Lord. The Apostle Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. I now no longer live, but now I live my life for Christ. And I do everything for the glory of God. You see, I can, lo I can love my spouse for my own sake. I mean, if I love Sandy, she's going to love me better and life's going to go a little better, right? Selfish. Many people do that. I, but I can grow in my love and I can love my spouse for her sake, which is better, right? That's definitely better than loving people for selfish reasons. And that's, that's great. But Christ is calling us to something even beyond that. I am called to love my spouse for Christ's sake. I am called to love her with his kind of love. Not my kind of love. My kind of love is really limited. I am, I am called to love her with his intentions. And so as I often said, quoting Bonhoeffer, Christ always stands before me and every other person in my life. And I love Christ, and he teaches me how to love others. And so I can love my vocation for my sake. I want to be a pastor to make so much money. I'm glad you laughed. You haven't been watching too many televangelists. I can love my vocation for the vocation's sake. I love preaching. And I can become a workaholic. Or I can love my vocation for Christ's sake. And it changes the way I respond. And I can love myself for my own sake. Or I can love myself for Christ's sake. Which means I don't even view myself through my own eyes. The love of Christ and his love for me enables me to love myself. So I seek first Christ to please him. I don't seek the love of others. That's what he's calling us to, as challenging as that is. And as I seek Christ daily, as I follow Christ daily, he changes my heart. I begin to love self better as I follow Christ. I begin to love others better as I follow Christ. I begin to love my spouse better as I love Christ first. As I am crucified with Christ, then I am en engulfed in Christ, and then what I do is Christ doing through me, living through me. And Jesus says that that's the way to live. That when, when we do things to be seen or to be praised by other people, the only we reward we'll get is what we get from people. But when we do it for God, God begins to do something in our life that transforms us. The reward is tremendous. The Christ follower must have a rich, deep, secret life. We must be like a flower rooted in the ground. And while the beauty is seen above the surface, uh, we know where it is most crucial. It's the soil. I mean, if you tell a child to go out and water flowers, what do they do? They usually water the petals. And they think that's, what, that's what's really key. But we know that's not the case. Don't worry about watering the petals. Uh, worry about nurturing the soil. 
give attention to the soil, you don't have to worry about the petals. And Jesus says the same thing in the sermon. Don't worry about your clothes. Don't worry about your outward appearance. Don't focus so much attention on how people view you. Look at the flowers of the field. They are not obsessed with those things, and yet God clothes them with beauty. In fact, Solomon in all his splendor was not dressed like one of these. So why are you so obsessed by how people will view you? Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. He's going to make you beautiful. Don't seek the praise of people. Don't live for the praise of people. Don't focus on the petals of the flower. Focus on the secret life, the soil of your life where no one sees. It is in those secret hidden practices that get no attention, that no one praises, that will produce the results. Because there is one who sees what is done in secret. And your Father in heaven will reward you. So what is the condition of our secret life? What is our condition of our secret life? Mary Oliver wrote a poem. I'll just read part of it. I love the ending of it. She says, I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I do know how to pay attention, how to fall down in the grass, how to kneel down in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I have been doing all day long. Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everybody, everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is your plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Tell me, what is your plan to do with your one wild and precious life? God is calling us to live and be all that he calls us to be. The rich young ruler sensed it. <laughs> I mean, he had everything. And he said, there's, there's something more. And he came to Jesus. And Jesus said, yeah, there is something more. You've not even scratched the surface of what you can become. But you have to surrender all and follow me. And there is something more. We are called to love the world for Christ's sake. We are called to love our life for Christ's sake, our family for Christ's sake, our community for Christ's sake. We are called to surrender our life to Christ, seek first the kingdom, and allow his love to transform us. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Lord, we... We ask ourselves these questions, what, what is it we're really after? We often think we're wanting one thing, and then when we get it, we find out that is not at all what we really needed or wanted. We, we seek a lot of things, and they don't satisfy us. As, as Jeremiah says, we, we go to broken wells, and we keep trying to get drinks from things that just don't satisfy us. And we just keep going back, keep going back thinking that this, this time we're going to really uh, get what we want. But you created us. You know us. And Lord, it begins, all begins, the the. the the abundant life that you call us all begins with recognizing our very deepest need is you. To seek first you and your kingdom. So Father, I pray that you would help us, Lord, the great temptation to look at others, Lord, we, we have to confess, Lord. Our motivations are so often so off. <laughs> And, and we get so caught up in what we see around us and don't live as Jesus lived with the kingdom of heaven right here. But that's what you're calling us, to live differently every day because we know 
The kingdom of heaven has invaded our world and invaded our life. Lord, I pray, Father, that we would develop those habits and practices that go beneath the surface, that no one sees, and we don't care if anyone sees. Those practices that draw us closer to you, that seek you. And then, Father, we will allow your work to do in our hearts. May we treasure you, Lord. You are our singular devotion. You are our north star. You center our lives. You are the gravitational center of everything we are. Now, Holy Spirit, pour your love in our hearts so that we have a deeper love for you that will change our hearts. Thank you, Lord, for this sermon. May it continue to speak to our hearts. Now we open our heart to you anew this morning. Oh, that the love of the Father and the life of Christ and the breath of the Spirit would quicken within us a greater affection for your ways, O Lord. Work your will in us, Lord Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Go in peace.